It's a tough neighborhood. The mothers in one building band together to protect their children from the surrounding danger. But a little girl vanishes from beneath their eyes. How did a monstrous evil slip past their guard? Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. times, people mark the world outside their borders with the words, beyond here there be monsters. They mounted guard against danger from the outside world. Inside the boundary, they kept their loved ones safe. Their greatest fear was that someday, a monster would cross that border. It's a bright July evening in Toronto, 1991. Emily Hood and her playmates are protected from the rough neighborhood surrounding their apartment building. They play under the watchful eyes of many caring women. Family dinner time is almost over. Emily steals a few more moments with her dad before he heads off to work. Emily's mom, Carrie, is taking the night off. She and her friend Stella are going to play bingo. That's fine with Emily because Valerie, her favorite babysitter, is going to look after her and her little sister. And there's still time before bed to play outside. Carrie knows the other mothers will keep a close eye on the kids. One by one, the other kids are called into bed. A few minutes later, the babysitter goes to fetch Emily from the playground, but she isn't there. Valerie knows Emily is chatty and likes to visit people in the building. She begins to check with the neighbors. One woman says she saw Emily heading towards the basement. Most have seen nothing. Now Valerie begins to panic. Maybe Emily is hiding. but she is nowhere to be found. Emily's mother is called home from the bingo hall. Her dad leaves work immediately. Within minutes, the police are alerted. Detective Terry Doyle gets the call. She wasn't in her apartment, so we searched the building. Wasn't in the building, so we searched the neighborhood. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. In some ways, that apartment building was kind of like an island in a storm. You've got crack dealers, prostitutes, mental health centers, group homes, halfway houses from prisons. And this building sits pretty well in the middle of all that. search begins throughout the neighborhood and across the country. Police collect statements from all the tenants in the building. Even Stella, her two sons, 
and her long-term border are questioned. Everyone has an alibi. Everyone is upset. Police check out the report that Emily went to the basement. There was a stranger down there who saw Emily that evening. But he had no time for the little girl. He was just hanging out with his friend, the building superintendent. Police receive hundreds of calls. One lead is promising. The night Emily went missing, a man described as having a lazy eye was spotted on a nearby street with a little girl in his arms, a little girl with blonde hair. A nationwide search begins for the man with the lazy eye. A little three and a half year old girl is a, is a true innocent and it's very upsetting for everybody. It was bad enough that she's not with her mother and what has happened to her is really gut wrenching and it's very hard for citizens and it's equally hard for police even though we have to put on uh, what's called a brave front. The police now concentrate on the halfway house next to Emily's building. It's exactly the kind of place any mother would fear. Among some of the occupants were um, people convicted of sex offenses. So clearly, that was a location that we wanted to look at very closely. Not all of them were previous sex offenders, but they all had psychiatric background, I guess it's a fair way to say it. But they were very cooperative, and they allowed us in uh, more than once to search the premises, and they were cleared reasonably quickly. A week has passed, and police have no suspects. It's hard to keep spirits up. Her friends try to give Carrie comfort and hope. Everyone's worst fears are finally confirmed. It's 20 days since Emily disappeared. A tiny body is found floating in the ship channel at the mouth of Toronto's Don River. The reality of Emily's death is a crushing blow. By the time that I had arrived, the officers had already secured the scene where the body was found. So my first priority was to photograph everything and have it videotaped before anything else is disturbed. You actually have to carefully remove some of the uh, the debris around the body to uh, look at the, uh, the clothing and, and make an identification. Emily Hood is fully clothed and there are no visible injuries. Her body is taken to a nearby hospital for closer examination by forensic pathologist, Dr. Frederick Jaffe. There are two things I noticed. The underpants were rolled down to about halfway down the buttocks, which was somewhat unusual. Once we uh, examined the interior organs, uh, we did find a tear in the vagina. There was very slight blood staining of the underwear, um, suggesting that this uh, tear at one time bled. We do know that she died shortly after her last meal. After death, the stomach does not empty. Nothing passes from the stomach into the intestine. The final pathology report states suffocation as the most likely cause of death. Emily's disappearance is now a murder investigation. A monster has crossed the border. Who could have snatched the little girl from under the vigilant protection of so many people?
Was Emily kidnapped, taken out of the building, then killed? How did she end up floating in the ship channel? We did receive information about a man who had been recently released from jail for two counts of sexual assault on young girls who lived in the area and also had a boat in the area of where the body was found. Investigators focused serious attention on this new lead. The investigation is now two months old. Police are looking at every possibility to break the case. The pedophile looks promising. That individual was looked at very closely for two or three weeks until we were able to account for his actions throughout the period. Once again, the search for Emily's killer is frustrated. But police do finally catch up to the lazy eye man. Well, he had a history with the police, and he did have a history of uh, psychiatric problems. But the little blonde girl people saw him with the night Emily disappeared is his daughter. Still, he continues to act like a guilty man. I suppose his paranoia just wouldn't allow him to admit that he could be a completely innocent party. The police have cast a wide net outside Emily's building. They've caught nothing. But forensic scientists have spent weeks examining the clothes Emily was wearing when she was found. Her body had been in the water for almost three weeks. Even so, a large number of unique cloth fibers were still caught in the folds of everything she was wearing. This immediately catches the attention of Jim Crocker, a fiber specialist at the Center of Forensic Sciences. It became apparent fairly quickly that there was a particular fiber type, which was uh, very short, an orange fiber. The the fact that these fibers were fairly straight, they were all about the same length, uh, indicated to me that it was probably from some type of velour material. And the velour are used extensively, of course, in upholstery. But at last, the police have a solid lead. Exhibit A, tiny fibers from a piece of fabric that will weave a net to catch a monster. Ordinarily, we accumulate fibers Two hours later, uh, 80 to 90% of those fibers will be gone from our body because they're very loosely held. The orange fibers that were transferred to Emily's clothes didn't have a chance to be shaken loose. For Jim Crocker, finding the source of the orange fibers is vital. It could possibly indicate the last place where Emily was alive. Police refocused their attention on the apartment building looking for a piece of furniture covered with orange velour. Jim Crocker's search pays off when they reach Stella's apartment. When we entered the living room, there was a sofa and a hassock that were precisely what I would expect these fibers to be from. This is exactly what we're looking for but certainly that would indicate to me that at the time of death or uh, very close to the time of death, that would be the environment where the body would be. Of course, when the investigator said that, no, she was not in that apartment, my expression was, oh, I think she was. Once we located the couch that these fibers came from, we subsequently conducted a search warrant and seized an extensive number of articles, including the couch and the other furniture in the living room. Clothes, a comforter, and a mattress are also seized and sent to Jim Crocker. With this new evidence, police want to question the occupants more closely. So Stella, her two grown sons, and the boarder, Wayne Snowden, give police their alibis one more time. 
Stella was playing bingo with Emily's mother. One of her sons was attending a night school class. The other was visiting a friend. Snowden also went to visit a friend who wasn't home. He came back to find the search already on for Emily. Stella swore Emily had not been in her apartment that day. So how could Emily's clothes have so many fibers from Stella's apartment? Every time she left her own apartment to go to the deceased apartment, she would carry with her some of these orange fibers. They were literally spread throughout that apartment. There's also another type of fiber on Emily's clothes. Its origin is a mystery until Jim Crocker looks at the comforter from Wayne Snowden's room. I found that there was a comforter there that was composed of purple, burgundy, and black. It was a geometric pattern. All of these types were ultimately found present on the clothing of the deceased. The orange couch fibers were found in every room in Stella's apartment, but fibers from the comforter were only found in one place. Wayne Snowden's bedroom. What kind of a man was Stella's boarder? He very rarely ever came out. If he did, it was to go to this one friend's home and spend the evening there, and then he would come back home again. To a great degree, he was a person without a personality. He was just uh, somebody that was immediately forgettable. He'd lived in Stella's apartment for three years. He never caused a problem. Still, all the evidence is pointing to his bedroom as the place of death. But suddenly, it's not so simple. Snowden had recently thrown out his mattress. It would be covered with fibers from the orange couch and his own comforter. What if Emily had come into contact with the mattress after it was thrown out? That might explain how the fibers were distributed within the clothing. That means she might never have been in these room at all. Investigators still can't be certain Emily was in Snowden's bedroom until they find out what happened to his mattress. Furthermore, tests for semen or blood on the clothes seized from Snowden's room come back negative. It's another blow for police. But Wayne Snowden's alibi isn't holding up well under scrutiny. Detectives question the friend whom Snowden said wasn't home when he came to visit. The man tells police he was in the whole evening. Now Jim Crocker gets the answer he needs. The discarded mattress was actually tossed into the alley beside the building. Emily would have had no way of playing on it. The gate to the alley is always locked. The comforter fibers on Emily's clothes could only have come from Snowden's bedroom. The investigation has been underway for several months. Now Keith Kelder, a blood specialist at the biology lab, has the chance to perform a new and more sophisticated test on a pair of Snowden's cutoff genes. We found a number of washed blood stains in the front and on the back, primarily in the front. The thinking was that since uh, Mr. Snowden was developed as a suspect, that this might be the child's blood. And so we proceeded with that in mind. The initial testing was negative, but I took it a step further by cutting out a tiny little fraction of the staining for each one of these and tested it directly for blood, which we do, on what might be washed blood stains, which I suspected in this case, and it came up positive. That blood stain is located on the inside fly of Wayne Snowden's cutoffs. The location is incriminating because Emily had been a victim of sexual assault. DNA tests confirm a match to her blood. The net has finally closed around a monster. Nine months after her death, Wayne Snowden is arrested for the murder of Emily Hood. To suggest that Snowden is a fairly strange character is really not saying much, but he stayed in his room almost all the time. 
his life consisted of watching TV and sleeping. Hardly anybody ever noticed him. Um, he was just there. But how had Snowden eluded the massive search and spirited Emily's body out of the building? Identification officers construct a model of the building. It will help them understand how the murder of Emily happened and how the killer could conceal her body and escape with so many people around. Immediately after she became missing, there was a lot of police activity, but the other side of the building on the intersecting street, there was no traffic. And we were able to show by this model that our, our suspect could have carried the body into the basement through a set of hallways and actually exited the building on another street out of the public eye. It was now Carrie's turn to comfort Stella, who couldn't believe that all this time she had been innocently sheltering Emily's killer. We're dealing with somebody who is only three and a half years old. They haven't had time to become bad or to become world weary. They don't know their true innocence. And people expect the police to protect of anybody to protect the true innocence. And the police expect of themselves. No one knows how Emily Hood ended up in Wayne Snowden's room inside Stella's apartment. Still, ident officer Rick McEwen has his theory. The puppet was found in our suspect's room. When we found this puppet, we all realized, having children of our own, how susceptible children are to somebody playing with a puppet. So it was just another possible way on how our victim could have been lured into this apartment. surrounded by shadows and fears, the women of Emily Hood's building created a protected and caring environment for their children to shelter them from the monsters without. They never suspected there was one living in their midst. The stories on Exhibit A are based on true cases. The forensic scientists and investigators are the actual individuals who worked on each case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the guilty are real. <laughs>